Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ainsley Sparks. I'm the marketing manager at BookNet Canada, and I just wanted to welcome you to Tech Forum 2020. Uh, the BookNet team is heartbroken that we couldn't put on this year's event as planned, but we're making the best of it, and we're happy that we're able to give all of our great speakers a platform to share their fantastic content, and we're also happy that you and all our attendees can still access the valuable professional development that you've come to expect from our event. So today we're happy to introduce Brian O'Leary from the Book Industry Study Group to share his Tech Forum presentation, Building a Better Workflow, Recommendations from the BISG. Uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat window at any time, and I'll save them to ask Brian at the end. And so now, without further ado, I will pass things off to Brian. Uh, thank you for coming to today's presentation, Building a Better Publishing Workflow. Like Ainsley, uh, I'm sorry that we're not able to do this in person but that uh, I'm glad that we are um, uh, here today. A couple of pieces of this question were actually built to be a little bit more interactive than be the case, but maybe we can use the chat to have that done. So I have eight components for what we're uh, uh, talking about today. The first is a brief uh, overview of, of how we define workflow. We'll also talk about what led BISG to get involved in the topic and what makes it important to us. We have a little bit of data on uh, the impact of the pandemic uh, and how it's changed our thinking about workflow, uh, what the industry is telling us. And then I'm going to talk in, in some greater detail about best practices for how to improve your workflows, which is certainly something a lot of organizations, uh, not just publishers, are looking at now that we're working from home, working remotely, and, and in different ways. We'll also talk about challenges and some of the recommendations we've made in, in a white paper that you can access uh, uh, without charge. And uh, and then we'll, we'll conclude with some steps you can take after this webinar. So let's start with workflow. Uh, we define it as the combined impact of decisions that are made about three different things, process, uh, tools or technologies, and structure and people. So process are the, the steps that we take to get something done, and that's pretty straightforward. But tools or technologies, the things that we use to accomplish something, uh, can be as uh, simple as a, a, a blue pencil or a red pencil to, to line edit. It could also be uh, the technology that we're used to uh, for managing uh, complex workflows across documents, people, and, and systems. Uh, structure itself uh, are the people who do the work, the roles as well, that, that, and how they've been defined, and how the work itself is organized and divided. And although this diagram shows three circles of, of equal size, the fact is that the uh, any workflow depends more or less on one or more of these areas. Uh, some are technology or tool driven, some are people driven, and some are very much uh, dominated by process. Now, it's kind of an interesting thing, to, uh, what led us to work look at uh, workflow. The uh, committee itself that we have was formed in late 2018. But the topic is actually pretty consistent with our objectives. The first part is that we do want to serve um, as an information hub for the book industry supply chain, and there are a lot of questions about this to, and some of the things that we're working on we'll, um, we'll, we'll talk about later are, are in that category. But it's also an emerging topic. People are becoming uh, increasingly both aware of and interested in figuring out ways to work uh, collaborative, collaboratively within organizations as well as across the supply chain, and we want to be uh, a resource there as well. Uh, the committees that we have are all working on some aspects of workflow. Supply chain itself is the macro workflow, workflow. but we also have uh, a workflow committee formed in uh, 2018 that addresses the specifics uh, and also works with other committees to try and introduce uh, the thinking that we have um, uh, around uh, how to best organize work. Within the workflow committee, uh, we created last year a white paper called Fixing the Flux uh, that was published last fall. It's available on the website for free. All you have to do is be a registered user of the site. You don't have to be a member. Um, and if you have any difficulties with setting up an account, you can always just contact us. That committee is also working on a tools and resources grid and glossary, uh, a grid meaning kind of a compilation by segment 
of the tools uh, that are most likely to be used uh, in each segment. And then the glossary, uh, more, more detailed definition of terms, as well as uh, pointing to some of the resources uh, with web links and the like. Uh, that committee is also helping to map the metadata, physical, and digital supply chains, and that work is happening elsewhere within BISG. One thing that we've also found is that uh, a lot of problems are rooted in some form of workflow. So you see uh, a strain placed on organizations and supply chains by things that are fractured or ineffective workflows that create rework, rework and the like. Um, workflows that are, that are not well designed are typically expensive. But they're also a hindrance, so you miss opportunities, you lose revenue, uh, as well as increased costs, because you have to work around some of those things. The other thing that's interesting, um, and this has changed over the last decade or more, is that the legacy workflows that are typically print-driven have trouble scaling. Uh, they can't support digital or platform agnostic models readily. Uh, and, we th and a lot of that is that therefore handled in some parallel way, which creates its own set of problems. The other thing that we've seen in the industry is that small teams or departments invent workflows to serve their own needs, but that can create problems downstream. To talk a little bit more about uh, why workflow itself is important, um, I offer three interrelated uh, arguments. The first part is that workflow, uh, by its definition, determines how we operate. And the second piece of it is that uh, it also is it's a fact, particularly in a digital environment, that how we work is increasingly determines how we compete. And then design of workflows themselves either enable or limit our effective competitiveness. And I wanted to try and draw on a non-publishing example that dates back to the 1970s. And I, I'll ask, uh, maybe we can do it in, um, in chat. Does anyone remember uh, this particular uh, jingle in the company that it was for? Hold the pickle, hold the lettuce, special orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us have it your way. Any, anyone uh, on, on have, the chat? We have at least one. Oh, huh, there we go. Yeah, someone who identified it as Burger King. You're, you're right. Oh, lots it of is. people are coming in. All right. so you're a little bit, uh, I'm a little bit faster than the chat is then. Um, you're all right, it is Burger King. And why is that important? Um, well, let's look at what uh, Burger King's competitor uh, was saying at the same time. You might remember the, uh, they were also in 1974 uh, introducing the Big Mac um, with uh, the, the almost uh, impossible to pronounce two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. But what were they also saying? Have it our way. Why is this example useful for workflow? Uh, because the, the two companies were competing uh, on the basis of their workflow. Uh, if you look at Burger King, its customer positioning was customized and flexible, uh, and its workflow model was made to order. Uh, you came, uh, they had standardized components, quick assembly, and a, and a more varied menu uh, that was based upon those components. McDonald's, on the other hand, was competing on being fast, consistent and of high value, um, but they did that by making the inventory. Uh, they were always creating uh, food and then and then making having it stored uh, directly behind uh, generally wh where you would uh, place your order. There was uh, the inventory was always available, but they they had actually a more limited product line. Um, that was how they competed. Um, a lot has changed since 1974. Customer preferences are certainly driving some of that. But the number of menu op options has, has expanded significantly, and the ability to deliver on their value proposition has also been affected. But to the extent that they failed to maintain a focus on workflow, might have created some of the issues that, particularly in a, in a poorly run franchise um, that you see today. But in uh, 40 years ago, uh, in the early 1970s, uh, actually now close to 50, the uh, Burger King and McDonald's had very different approaches to how they, they served their customers, and it played out in both what they did and how they were valued. I also wanted to talk a little bit about what we're hearing um, in the current uh, environment. 
we did a survey. Uh, it was put out in uh, in the marketplace in uh, late March and closed uh, in the first week of April. And we did a presentation on it actually a week ago yesterday uh, with our board. But the survey um, that we put out, uh, three quarters of the audience was already working remotely. And uh, if anything, that, that percentage has probably gone up. Uh, two thirds were saying that in-person workflows will need to be rethought. That actually was the single uh, highest response among all the people that we talked to. Uh, and the workflow comments, the you know the open-ended comments that were part of the survey, really were significant. Uh, people were saying things like, "How do I safely handle arriving shipments?" or "My whole life as an editor feels like it needs to change." Um, web orders are up, but we can't get enough staff to process them. Uh, what do we do now that we can't sell in person? And then somebody raised questions about back office support. Uh, these are all really important workflow questions. And people are also seeking more information about how to address questions like, um, what do we do now that bookstores are closed? Uh, what's happening with print on demand production? How can we reach buyers directly? Um, what options are available for processing materials? That particularly is a library perspective. Uh, we need timely notification of delayed and canceled publication dates. I mean, the, the system is set up for updates to metadata generally on a weekly basis, and people are looking for uh, both more and, and more immediate uh, information. And then finally, at the bottom, you know, workflow, resources, uh, updates from vendors and manufacturers were all critical pieces of the puzzle. So clearly, the, if anything, if we were strained before on workflow, the pandemic has, has made it e an even um, bigger issue for the industry. So we, one of the things that we did uh, well before the pandemic was create a, a white paper uh, that white paper uh, was first conceived because uh, a number of people in the in the meta, in the workflow committee felt that publishing was largely learned on the job. Uh, there aren't really very good defined best practices for workflow. There's no user's manual. Um, that plays out in a variety of different ways, but uh, as consolidations and acquisitions occur, uh, just trying to ma ma mix two different companies and two different approaches to uh, book publishing or distribution is really difficult. Uh, we thought there was an opportunity as well to improve the quality, to enhance analytics and increase efficiencies across the industries. And many of the things that we were working on uh, with respect to uh, uh, problems, one an example would be the creation of EPUB, are symptoms of bad workflows, essentially that they haven't been conceived with the end in mind. One of the things that's important to keep in mind, too, is that uh, we, I showed before the, the, the definition of workflow is the, the intersection of structured tools and process. But the relative importance of each component varies. Um, the size could be, could be different. The thing to keep in mind, though, is that they remain interdependent in any size. If you change one part, uh, for example, introducing a new technology, a new platform, uh, without, without considering the impact on uh, people and process, uh, that that kind of change to, or investment seldom sticks. It it often results in confusion, resistance, and sometimes even rejection of the solution that you have is not, not credible or not working. So to, to get at uh, that problem and and to try and figure out a way to improve publishing in an organized way, um, in the white paper you'll see we are, we identified seven different steps, and I have details in each of these seven, so I'm not going to read through them at this level. Um, but we'll start rather with the importance of making workflows visible. Um, one of the things I, I think it's, it's self-evident if you've done any workflow uh, uh, studies at all, but you start by drawing maps or pictures. Um, often you try to set boundaries. You can't document the entire supply chain at the outset, so it might be start and end dates you know, for, for a particular process or intervals, like this is the part where we, we, we're working on uh, line copy editing. Uh, the also the other thing that can govern it are activities or deliverables uh, that can be handoffs to departments, a function, a function, or even to another company. So if you think about printing specifications, uh, preparing them might be something that a publisher does, and then receiving and, and processing something that a printer does. Uh, and one thing that's really important at that level is to think about interviewing, and maybe not in a formal sense, but at least having a conversation with colleagues and or uh, folks who receive the output of a particular uh, step in the process uh, before uh, creating those maps. 
internal documentation often is uh, a, a, a clear signal uh, and and uh, resource for creating uh, workflow maps. The second uh, part of it is then is not to keep it to yourself, um, to do things that help you share the maps, pictures, and workflows. Um, the the goal is is to improve cross-functional or cross-company uh, understanding and efficiency. The uh, but it's not to create necessarily the perfect perfect map. Um, one example of it is uh, research that BISG did in 2012. Uh, on metadata handoffs. Uh, it showed that there were disconnects between providers and recipients, both in terms of what they expected and how they defined certain uh, components of metadata, uh, but also uh, uh, it created uh, uh, we we work and sometimes overwriting. And that kind of miscommunication uh, typically does create we, we work and or problems for uh, anyone who's receiving and sometimes even sending metadata. That, that the example is actually can be even broader than that. The third step is to talk about it. I mean, the maps are a means, not an end. Um, having conversations about what you see in, in various product maps uh, and workflows is, is a basis for moving from a two-dimensional uh, picture to understanding what's actually happening. And the visuals are a prompt for true dialogue rather than simply being here, I've mapped the perfect process or I, I have a perfect answer for it, but to ask questions about it. It's also an opportunity to create and build relationships, and that's critical later in the process, something that uh, um, the committee, when it was working on the white paper, came back to again and again, is that it's it's really hard to change something when people don't see eye to eye on what's actually what, the problem that they're trying to solve. The fourth piece is to ask open-ended questions. Um, this is to test your understanding. Um, we we typically refer to it as five whys, meaning to keep asking uh, at each level, well, why is that the case? Why is something else, and for each answer, to better understand what the cause and effect components of an issue are. Um, getting at root causes is critically important. Um, they, if you're only working at the level of symptoms, then it's uh, it's problematic because you may not be uh, getting at the, the source of the biggest issues in a in, uh, poorly designed workflow. The other thing about open-ended questions is that it's an opportunity to build partnerships. It's important not to assign blame uh, in those conversations or to, to qualify the, the process as good or bad, but rather that it's not doing what you need it to do. The fifth is to try and explore options as broadly as possible. Um, this came in relatively late in the discussion that we had for the, uh, the committee, but uh, one, one uh, industry provider, service provider um, in particular said that a lot of times people say, well, I've decided I'm going to implement this tool, this technology. Uh, maybe they, they heard about it from a vendor. They could have also heard it from a colleague or, or somebody in another company but they haven't really examined the op all the options that might be reasonably uh, considered to solve a problem. And that limited resource research often leads to less effective workflows. The um, uh, one way to, to get more information is to talk with colleagues at other companies, uh, as well as to talk with solutions providers. Um, they, they're often a font of information. The importance, though, is to research, to do the research early, not after you've done a decision, after a decision's been made. And um, um, the sixth is, and, and maybe this is uh, something you'd expect from a, a book industry study group or BookNet Canada, is to promote meaningful use of standards. Um, the, by this we mean, ideally, standard implementation of standards. There's always an argument for customization uh, in, in developing workflows, but you have to recognize that the supply chain itself is interconnected and uh, what one company's unique need may be is somebody else's compatibility issue. And trying to sort through, the, through those is a big piece of improving workflows. And then the last piece uh, in terms of, of how to, to go about improving a workflow is to regularly reevaluate 
the things that you've done. You want to define the change you want to make, uh, whether whatever the problem or opportunity is. You need to measure the outcomes um, as they currently are. Uh, analyze what's happening in, by doing some of that mapping and the, and the steps that the, uh, we covered a few minutes ago. Uh, and then pick something to work on, something to improve, and uh, identify feedback loops that are going to get you information about whether the proposed change is working better, worse, uh, not no difference at all. And then measure that the, over time. Uh, not going back often creates problems for a variety of different uh, uh, folks within the within the supply chain because somebody's saying this is working great but they're not necessarily looking across all the different actors in, this, in, the, ch in the chain. One thing that you'll see in the paper, and this is a, a fair amount of work that uh, people are um, put, put together, that there are a number of challenges to improving workflows, and it's one of the reasons why it doesn't get done more often. Uh, one, one problem is that uh, multi-party problems, so whether it's uh, um, one department talking to another in a publishing house or a publisher talking to a manufacturer or sending metadata to a variety of third parties. Um, trying to fix those multi-party problems requires extended coordination. You know, larger mapping pro projects can be really hard to coordinate. And so across departments and divisions is sometimes uh, maybe even often resisted. Um, so figuring out ways to move across departments and sections of segments uh, can be handled uh, by define by agreeing on defined markers for handoffs, they say, well, we'll 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 follow this standard for metadata and we'll do it consistently. But those agreements only come through conversations that clearly define what happens, by whom, and when. Uh, so that's a critical piece of it. The second thing to think about is fixing only local problems often sub-optimizes um, uh, and hurts workflow effectiveness. You know, if you're optimizing for the needs of one department or a single company. That's likely to create rework or the need for some sort of translation or conversion elsewhere. So if the overall goal is to minimize the resources required to deliver value to the end user, the impact on either other departments or other companies in the supply chain as a whole makes a big difference. So an example can be found for example, uh, in something like on-demand printing. Uh, the unit cost per book exceeds traditional inventory dri driven models, or at least it has to this point. Uh, but if you can, if you include high returns or uneven de demand, um, that, you know, that actually can result in a lower cost per book sold if you're using the on-demand solution. So you want to pick the macro measures that deliver the right outcomes, not just uh, look at uh, one piece of it. Um, it's, it's also the case that legacy practice may be embedded in uh, the workflows that are already exist. Um, they get codified and embedded, um, and often enough, there were good practices in the past, but they may be limiting us now. Um, you know, an example is for print products, the folio convention, putting page numbers that's used by layout software makes perfect sense, but it can complicate efforts to make an ebook uh, or to sell a component or to create an index for an environment that doesn't have pages. So when things like new formats or uses arise, workflow often needs to be rethought. There are sometimes, uh, and this can be both personality as well as some organizational norms, uh, untouchables. Uh, so book publishing is, is sometimes described as a mixture of art and science, uh, and there's debate about where the line is drawn. But if changes are proposed or resisted without appropriate measurement and analysis, um, the people involved in the change effort can point to organizational culture as the culprit. Um, there are challenges that affect the ability to innovate or introduce new, new approaches to things like data management. And from the outside, it's important to minimize the impact of untouchable aspects of workflow, whether it's a function of technology, people, or process. When real roadblocks exist, any plan should acknowledge them and provide adequate rationale and, and workarounds, because if you don't have that, um, resistance is easy to double. Um, there's an issue with shifting the burden, particularly at the outset. A lot of times uh, workflow improvement efforts start uh, with a change that creates an outsized impact on, on some uh, one or more parts of the existing supply chain. 
So if you're implementing a new title management system, as an example, you may require data entry whose benefits accrue to a part of the business that's actually not entering the data. Um, resistance to those kinds of changes can be addressed in a lot of different ways, including temporary staff, incentive conversation, and regularly reinforcing the context for the change, which should be a senior management priority. As you can probably imagine from the things that we've been talking about, it's messy work and the people who lead it get tired. Uh, any change effort uh, requires uh, a champion of some sort um, and also regular uh, and ongoing uh, communication, assessment, and refinement. Um, if you have job responsibilities, and we all do, that, that are in addition to improving workflow, uh, that can pull them, anyone away from uh, the tasks that, that are required to do good work, improving workflows. Um, and, you know, in the best practices part that I covered a moment ago, you know, getting people to change uh, what they do, creating buy-in, requires conversation as much as it needs analysis and, de and design, uh, and that takes energy. So I think we found that the successful organizations, uh, staff change management efforts with an owner or product manager, some sort of champion, um, and I think with the importance of both maintaining those leaders, giving them the capacity to do the work that's expected of them, expected of them and <clears throat> and also uh, over time replacing them uh, is critically important. And the last piece, not to discourage you, is that the work doesn't end. Um, it's like painting a bridge. You know, improving workflows never really stops. There's always more work to do. Um, and you know, each change effort requires that that definite starting with a definition and, and ending with uh, establishing controls, which in turn starts a new cycle. Uh, so uh, organizations that have tended to operate on a steady state basis, um, uh, you know, are, I think are finding that it's particularly difficult for them uh, on an ongoing basis to uh, uh, kind of sustain that en energy. So our recommendations actually are, are pretty straightforward. Uh, the first of these is to follow those seven best practices in tackling uh, workflow projects. Um, the second is to expect challenges. Uh, the uh, um, it's it's not simply the case that the best argument wins. I think there are, it's because uh, there are both uh, embedded uh, tools and technologies, uh, as well as organizational structures involved. Uh, changing how you work. Um, uh, is going to have uh, an impact on the organization, and that takes energy and time. Um, but keep in mind the, uh, the the kinds of challenges that we talked about a moment ago. You know, if you don't if you don't think about multi-party uh, processes, if you fix only local problems, um, if you only work uh, uh, with the the uh, with legacy processes, it's going to be difficult to get past um, the and get over the hurdles that naturally come up in any change effort. Um, it's important to keep in mind that workflow components are interdependent. One of the things that, that regularly happens, and a number of folks in the workflow committee talked about it, is that the, we've, a magic block, back, black box solution is introduced, whether it's a technology or a change in organizational structure, and the other parts of the business are not considered. So if you're not looking at all three workflow components uh, interactively, you're likely to uh, uh, f find um, that your, your change efforts are either limited or unsuccessful. Um, it's okay to start small, but generally don't stay, stay small. Um, improving things across the industry, particularly where we're increasingly digital and working to make books seen for thing, using metadata, uh, require engagement across the supply chain. And that's an area where BookNet Canada uh, and hopefully Book Industry Study Group uh, can be helpful in trying to surface those conversations. It's important to maintain change management skills uh, and ideally to begin with the end in mind. You know, you want to tackle the problems ideally that have the greatest benefit and there, there are low-hanging fruit at most companies operating across the supply chain. But if you only go after those ones, um, it might limit your conversations about the macro changes that you could be making that would significantly change how uh, the industry operates, and that's an area where BISG in particular is um, uh, trying to focus its efforts, both in, in the context of the pandemic, but also coming out of it. So just briefly, uh, two, two slides on steps you can take. The first is to become better informed. Uh, if, you're, if, uh, if you've not already, do download uh, the workflow white paper, 
We've made it freely available to anyone in the industry. We encourage folks to talk to your partners um, and you know, ask them uh, in a frank uh, and, and confidential way how they feel your company's workflow compares to others. Um, you, know, you may be a benchmark and can share that information, or you may, may find that uh, there are areas where you need to improve. And you can also talk to colleagues, uh, both inside your company, and you can follow what your competitors are doing. It's a relatively um, open industry. There are available resources, particularly for on the technology side for tools and, and resources. But it's, uh, something, it's also something we'll be creating a, a report on probably out in late June if we're successful in, in the work that we're doing. And then the second piece is to take advantage of um, this this particular moment in time, um, the white paper recommendations are, are good building blocks, but pick something to map. It can be small or it can be big. The current environment opens doors for a lot of experimentation. People are, are necessarily going to have to figure out how to re work remotely, uh, if not forever, but at least to strip things down to um, the, the core parts of uh, what we need to do to uh, make workflows effective across the industry. It's important to look for quick or early wins. And by this, uh, it's the kind of thing where, you know, momentum builds on itself. Uh, if you can, you can do something that provides benefit, uh, in the near term, it's gonna, uh, it creates both acceptance and, uh, some momentum around, uh, future change efforts. Uh, and the other thing you can do is, uh, both at BookNet Canada and, and for BISG, uh, be part of the organization and, and do, that's doing the work. Uh, we, our committee meetings are open to employees of all member companies, but in the recognizing the significant impact of the pandemic, we announced at the the call we had last week that we are actually opening membership for the, for at least the second quarter and perhaps after that um, to in committees to anyone who wants to join, independent of whether or not they're part of BISG. So. There are, we're not the only opportunity. There are other organizations that are doing work in this area, but th think about joining in because it's a, it's a good way to get exposure and also to better understand the perspectives of parts of the industry that you're not currently in. So with that, I'll pause and, and take questions if there are any. Hi, uh, it's Ainsley and I'm relaying the questions from the chat. Um, do you think the pandemic makes management more open to workflow suggestions? Um, I do. The I, and I, and I think it's partly because um, the, there, there, there's a limited choice uh, in being open to it. But I think this has uh, shown that we we have to hang together uh, as an industry much more than anything else that I've seen in in, in my career. The uh, at the the I talked about interdependence of process technology and, and structure, but there's also an interdependence across the industry, how booksellers do, um, how, how distributors are able to keep operating printing plants. The manufacturing sector in the last month has um, changed significantly, both uh, the two major players kind of backing out of the market. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, we, we need to think about this collectively. So, yes, absolutely. And one other question that we've got. So uh, if you see a workflow problem, who, who do you flag it to and how do you make sure you have the right team to optimize to fix more than just local problems? Well, it's um, this is both a theoretical and a practical answer. I mean, the, th the theoretical answer is you, you want to get the people involved who, who, touch, who are already part of the either the problem or the potential solution. Um, but more specifically, you need to look broadly um, and ask one of the questions you can ask is who else would be affected by this? Um, as, as an example, we've, we've been looking at in one of our committees at the, the impact of including price information in barcodes and how it, uh, as price volatility or, or price variability has increased over the last decade particularly in online environments, uh, it, it limits what some publishers can do in bricks and mortar. And so they've asked, uh, a couple have asked, you know, what, what happens, uh, how can we do this better without stickering or recalling inventory? Um, well, the, the question there is obviously you need to talk to um, all parts of the supply chain that would touch upon price. So you're looking at distributors and retailers in particular to get their perspective. 
Uh, and the answers are pretty complicated. Um, it requires a, an education in an, um, uh, in both parts of the business. That the, the good thing is for for us, those folks are generally already at the table. But if not, you have to ask who should be and how do we get how do we get them involved. So. Great, thank you. I think that's all the questions we had from the chat. Okay, um, I will have a, a couple of other slides that I just wanted to point to, if I could. Um, one is on uh, resources. I, I talked about the white paper. Uh, we have a workflow committee uh, that's open to any member. And right now, to anyone who's interested in joining, all you have to do is send a, a note to either info at BISG.org or to me, Brian, B-R-I-A-N, at BISG.org. Um, if you're interested in the work that we're doing overall, not just that committee, going to this particular link will actually get you uh, um, background information as well as uh, um, access to the charters that guide the committee work overall and the and the month to month plans that we're using to guide our meetings. Um, and I, I encourage you to look at our website as well as BookNet Canada's uh there uh I I'd say BookNet Canada is a better website, honestly. Um, but we try to uh do a lot of things in in terms of events and resources that are useful for thinking about workflow. And the last piece is that uh, we are continuing to work on this. Uh, we're developing that tools and resources grid and glossary. Uh, I hope to have it published uh, at least in draft form in June. Um, that's uh, an ongoing work in the work in, in the workflow committee. Um, we're also trying to document the current supply chain for physical products, uh, and we expect that we'll do it for other formats and for metadata uh, after that. But we want to get a good single uh, workflow map for the supply chain as a whole for physical. Uh, this year. Uh, we're trying to identify promising workflow projects. Uh, we've got a couple in mind, but uh, uh, there are probably more. And we're also trying to respond to what we heard in the COVID-19 survey, uh, that there's a, a quite a bit of, there's a need for a lot of different types of information. We had um, 250 responses and uh, more than 150 suggestions on uh, what people felt we could be doing. There's some overlap within it, but we're trying to be responsive to that. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you uh, to Brian for that excellent presentation, and uh, thank you to all of us for joining us today. Um, as I said, we're, we've recorded this video, and we'll send it out within a couple of days. It'll go up on the BookNet Canada uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I just saw a comment come in that said, Brian, can you become president of the U.S.? Um, <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, thanks again for uh, joining us, and uh, have a great afternoon.